Culture Committee to order at 9.01. Would you please stand for prayer? Dear Lord, we thank you for blessing the Cherokee Nation, our leadership, and all citizens. We lift up those who are struggling, either with bad health or grieving the loss of loved ones. We pray you will watch over all those serving in our, in our military, wherever they are. And we ask you to give us right minds and hearts as we serve our Cherokee citizens. In Jesus' name, amen. Shelly, roll call, please. Victoria Vesquez. Ani. Joe Bird. Ani. Keith Austin. Here. Harley Buzzard. Here. Julia Coates. Sean Crittenden. Here. Joe Deere. Here. Mike Dobbins. Kane and Duncan. Here. Rex Jordan. Daryl Legg. Here. Wes Snowfire. Here. Dora Petskowski. Here. Mike Shambaugh. Here. Mary Bakershaw. E.O. Smith, Janice Taylor, we have a quorum. Thank you, Shelley. Um, if you've all had a chance to uh, look over the minutes from the last meeting, ask for a motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed, motion passed. All right, we are ready for reports, and first up will be from Cultural Tourism, Ms. Molly Jarvis. Morning, Molly. Uh, for the Dwight mission, we did a close on that acquisition on June 22nd, and I believe you, uh, many of you will uh, go on a tour for, of that later this afternoon. So excited to hear your feedback uh, after that tour. We'll begin working on our future plans for that site uh, later this summer and um, knowing that the church will uh, be able to hold camps there in the future. That's part of our memorandum of agreement um, for the purchase of that property. Um, we continue to work on our uh, celebration of the anniversary of our Cherokee uh, syllabary bicentennial and uh, working on plans for a Sequoia Day in the fall. We have a lot of work going on right now um, in and around the uh, Heritage Center and working on uh, the strategic plan still for that property, which will be finalized later this month and, and communicated in August. Um, we are currently working uh, right now to do an inventory of the archives and collections at that site um, and plan to do a transfer of that inventory to our temporary location at Cherokee Springs uh, Plaza. I'm hoping that that is complete by the anniversary of the uh, Heritage Center on September 24th. We also have at that same location the Trail of Tears art show and hoping you've had a chance to get there. We feel like that's been pretty successful so far in just the first week um, that the art show was open. We've had more than $35,000 in sales from that art, which... Um, I, I believe is a is a highest grossing number for that art show. So the success of it online um, and in person is is working well at our temporary location. Um, and then we do have right now applications being submitted for the homecoming art show uh, held late August and into September. Um, and that will be held in the same format, both virtually and in person. We have active project with our cultural pathway in downtown Tahlequah. Uh, we had a, a little bit of a delay on that, but we are back on track and on schedule to be complete in September. Then we have another project. Um, we have the Venita Cultural Development and uh, work is beginning this week with the uh, construction company and that is scheduled to be complete in November. And we're going to have some renderings available for that project in August that I can uh, communicate and send to everyone. Um, another project that we are actively working on is our Will Rogers birthplace with the state of Oklahoma. And we are still working working with the state on some acquisition, um, final, finally, finalizing the acquisition process for that. Um, call it acquisition logistics. <laughs> so working with the state on that project. And then um, kind of a wrapping up here, we have the uh, Cecil Dick mural that was 
uh, preserved and that work has been complete. We are working on some proper framing um, for that piece to keep it safe and secure. And then the plan is for that to be located in the J Health Clinic. Um, just at our current museums, we have uh, exhibits up celebrating our bicentennial of the syllabary. And then at Celine, our featured artist right now is Dorothy Sullivan with the art is in its meaning exhibit. Um, and then just an update on kind of our properties. Uh, you know, since we've had the COVID restrictions somewhat lifted, but people seem to be uh, visiting more. And we've had about 8,000 visitors um, so during the month of June, which is, which is a high, high number for, for us, even surpassing pre-COVID um, numbers. So we're very happy with our attendance and continuing to um, keep our protocols in place to keep people safe. Um, but very happy that people are out and visiting, visiting our sites and locations. So I think that's most of my highlights, if there are any questions for me. Thank you, Molly. Question? Councillor Taylor. I have one regarding um, doing the art shows online and in person. Are you seeing purchases from a wider range of consumers rather than when they have to come and, and buy it? I'm just wondering if it's opening up new markets for our artists? That's a great question. Um, and when we did the Cherokee art market online last fall, that was the first time, and sales didn't come through us to facilitate those sales, it would direct, but this time they are. So let me gather some data for you. This time the sales are going through the process we used through the gift shop. Um, so let me gather some data and I'll, I'll report back to you. I'd just be curious to know if that's reaching a broader audi audience for the artists. I suspect it probably is. Great question. I'll, I'll be able to pull some zip code information. Hi, Molly. Hi. Molly, I'm curious. On our artifacts and some of our extremely older paintings and things, do we have uh, the ability to store them correctly with the temperature and uh, all we do at this well time? we I'm, I'm kind of nodding yes we we are that is part of the process we're going through um, with the archives and collections from the Heritage Center so the new facility that is at Cherokee Springs Plaza is a hardened facility inside that core which is um, environmentally sound um, monitoring temperature humidity and all of those things also um, a bit weather proof for tornadoes or things like that it, it like I said it's a hardened shell and fire resistant so yes once we get the pieces into that facility and then in our facilities like the Cherokee National History Museum yes we monitor temperature and humidity in all of our all of our cases and the entire facility and and have notifications set up if, if um, as something is not at the correct um, environmental standard I, w I was just going to suggest, you know, Gilcrease is kind of doing a reboot. Mm -hmm. uh, I was going to suggest maybe you might want to send a team over there to see what all they're considering that we might need to consider here. Yeah, great, great idea. And we've worked closely with them, and they have a couple of things on, on loan to them that they're storing for us for that exact reason. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Well. <coughs> um, Molly, are you guys... Um, are y'all doing the Cherokee National Holiday? Is, it, is the event planning under you guys? No, sir. Okay. All right. I just seen these pamphlets coming out. I was like, okay, wait a second. Are these under, those are going to be under uh, Kevin. Who's? Can I, can I see that will be it's under actually, uh, Austin Pay, uh, Payton is uh, one of the coordinators. Okay. He's one of the coordinators. So if and I if I may, holiday, he is going to be here during um, ENF today with Commerce, because he's under Anna, and so he's going to be here to give us kind of a rundown of that this afternoon. Okay. I'll just hold my questions for them then. Appreciate it, Molly. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it, Chair. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Molly, is, is there a, uh, a blueprint or drawings of what the downtown uh, is supposed to look like? Because yes, that's the, really, you know, look, looking good. You know, you, you, you look like you paved over, made some uh, walking uh, streets there mm -hmm. in, in that old place. Is that going to be, is there a drawing somewhere we can view? Yes, absolutely. I can get those renderings to you. Yeah, it'll have um, 
some columns that make it an entry, so you're entering actually entering a space, mm -hmm. and yes, um, some uh, public art through there, and places where artists can also set up in the future for outdoor markets, mm -hmm. benches. Um, it would be a very welcoming uh, pathway to connect all of our uh, assets downtown. But Great. yes, I can get those renderings. Just and get share. that to Gail, maybe some, some yes. of the councilors may be interested in, in viewing it. It's going to be really a neat project. I thank you really beautified that area there. You're connecting all of our, our sites now, Supreme Court, the uh, yeah. Historic Museum, so all of that's coming together. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Yes, I'll share Madam that. Chair. I have a quick uh, question, Molly. Uh, since we're opening up the facility or the museums and things, have um, is there protocol for visitors to wear a mask or is it do so, yes, so following the last executive order that um, asked that we send those protocols to chief of staff for approval, um, we have done that. And so the modifications that we made to the protocols um, were that we, we were still doing the temperature scanning um, and then requiring guests to wear masks. So we submitted a plan to chief of staff in low that included um, stopping the temperature scanning and then um, shifting to a mask recommendation for visitors, but then staff is still required to wear masks, and we still have all of our COVID cleaning protocols in place, including asking people to social distance. We're, we're still not doing group sales and inviting large groups or motor coaches in. Um, so yeah, the two, two, two primary changes that we made were um, taking away the temperature scanning and then shifting from a mask requirement for guests to a mask re recommendation uh, just for guests and then staff is still required to. Okay, great. And will you have uh, masks available for those that don't have them? Yes. <laughs> All right, yes. thank you. Any other questions? All right, great. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Molly. All right, next up, we're going to hear from Mr. Howard, pa Howard Payton with the Cherokee Nation Language Department. Yep. Always good to hear from Howard. Welcome. CO. CO. It is nice to be here in person. start off by saying that um, on July 16th we had the graduation for the immersion school um, due to um, us not being able to do graduations last last year because of COVID uh, we we did all the graduations together uh, at the Heritage Center so it was a um, it was a nice event we had last year's kindergarten class, this year's kindergarten class, last year's sixth grade class, this year's sixth grade class. And we wanted to include a traditional meal and uh, come together as kind of a family. Uh, we know that um, if we're gonna be successful in saving language, uh, we're gonna have to look at that as a, as a family, you know, language family. And so we're wanting to definitely partner up with our, our parents of the immersion school and make them feel uh, more at home and the, having the meal together, uh, laughing, even though it was a little bit warm, uh, that was a, a good event. Um, on um, uh, registration open on July, I mean June uh, 21st for Mr. Edfield's uh, <laughs> summer online class. Uh, classes began uh, on July 5th uh, at learncherokee.org. Uh, Mr. Wade Blevins continues to uh, film at uh, RSU Television for Cherokee Two classes. Um, the goal is to have 48 episodes. Um, as of June 25th, we had uh, 34 completed. Um, uh, CLAMAP or Cherokee Language Master Apprentice Program uh, has turned returned to face-to-face -face language sessions. Uh, the fourth and final uh, edition will be complete in, this, in the program's expansion. Uh, this program was um, quadrupled, and so uh, it, it took a different format where we broke them up in, in six-month increments and focused on 
certain proficiencies in each increment. So with that, uh, it, uh, it is working out really, really well. Uh, we believe in February, the first class that was involved in that, even though some of it was online, uh, will be graduating at the highest proficiency we've graduated a, a total class. So it'll be interesting to see when that's up and running uh, for a, a long period of time and we're able to start tweaking curriculum here and there. Uh, so uh, we're inspired by that. Um, the, 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 part, the Department of Language has been attending virtual meetings with the uh, Oklahoma State Department of Education as part of the World Language Standards Writing Committee. Each Wednesday, where um, Mr. Blevins, who is on that committee, provides input to the state on the needs of indigenous language teaching in public schools. So this is something that we've been working on for a while, um, and we're hoping that um, that, that will be uh, a good partnership, and I think it will be. Uh, the Cherokee Nation Language Consortium was asked to prepare a traditional meal uh, for Tri-Council. I know uh, Councilman Bird was involved in that, and uh, we had the two events, one the graduation and then the other there, and so it was fun to watch people coming back and forth and cooking and, and uh, the laughter of them guys that's being together with UKB and, and with the Eastern Band was just fabulous. And so uh, that was something that uh, Councilman Bird has had in his heart, and I'm sure thankful, uh, Councilman, for uh, that vision because uh, um, just to take a, a day and just be Cherokee uh, was uh, was really, really inspiring for a lot of the folks that has been, um, you know, this, you know, staying away from other speakers during this uh, time of the pandemic. So it was outside event. We tried to stay as safe as we possibly could, and uh, and uh, uh, they had fish, they had hog meat. That you know, it it, it just went on. So it was a, a really inspiring meeting. The tr uh, translation staff uh, wrapped up translations for story for 2021 all Cherokee language uh, issue for Cherokee Phoenix to be released during the Cherokee uh, national holiday. Uh, Dennis Six Killer continues to produce uh, Cherokee voices and Cherokee sounds radio station. The trans uh, translation staff continues to work with the uh, University of New Mexico to um, transcribe them different. Um, them different interviews, and so uh, this allows linguists and translators to go in and, and really piece together all these different words. So it's an interesting process. Um, they are uh, really, really doing a good job on that, and it's going to be beneficial for years to come. Um, the work they're doing just with them transcribing and uh, documenting all that. Um, Dennis Sixkiller and Sammy Steele have been uh, doing storytelling and marbles uh, demonstrations to, for a group of military families each Friday at the Cherokee uh, Heritage Center. Um, Klamap, our Master Apprentice representatives, have provided virtual uh, language pres uh, presentations to Tulsa Public Schools. Um, IAIA uh, and Tulsa Community College um, and OSU uh, as well. The um, language tech staff has been working with Apple Font. They're updating that uh, the Silberry on the, on the uh, Apple products and working through any uh, problems they may have had with some of the characters. Uh, also, language tech has uh, pr uh, printed 275 Cherokee language posters and uh, mailed them out to different uh, educational organizations. Um, also mailed out some USBs uh, that has a lot of our information on it. Um, and they uh, assisted, of course, with the graduation that we had for uh, the immersion school students. Uh, the um, Living Language Grant applications for, uh, for that uh, ends two days from now, so if you if you have anybody that's wanting to do concurrent enrollment, uh, please uh, uh, instruct them to 
to get a hold of Miss Raven Bruner, and uh, she will work with them to uh, to definitely get that. Um, Native Language uh, Community Coordination, the NLCC Committee, uh, they continue to, to meet uh, bi-weekly. This is a grant that we've had uh, now for five years. We have one more year on that, um, and um, it, it has allowed the different uh, programs of language to come together, and they, we, they meet bi-weekly, and uh, it's been really beneficial uh, to, to find out what the other ones are doing and, and working in tandem. So this is a, has, has been good. Um, we have, uh, they also hosted uh, the Eastern Band. Uh, Eastern Band also has a, um, what they call a call program. Uh, it's about like uh, our master apprentice program. So um, when they was down, we, we shared our curriculum that we, we have been producing for that program uh, to, uh, to help them in any way we possibly can. Uh, and them guys are doing a good job uh, at the Eastern Band and they're uh, being with them and seeing what they're doing and, and them seeing what we're doing is always inspiring. So uh, it's something that uh, we're working with them on to, uh, to allow our second language learners to start building relationships. I know, uh, you know, now it's been a, a few decades ago that we've, that uh, the speakers has started building relationships and we've came to the conclusion that um, the passing of so many speakers, we better build relationships with our second language learners, with their second language learners, to make sure that that relationship is still strong and we're still in one mind, one heart. So um, meeting with them is always, always good uh, because they're definitely our brothers and our sisters. So uh, the, the uh, Cherokee Teacher, uh, Teacher Bridge pro uh, Project, this project is a, a grant that we've received from a and &A. um, We're working to, to build um, the curriculum for it. Um, it's, it's something that, that I think is going to be really, really good, or we think is going to be really, really good. Um, they've, they've contacted different universities and they're getting their curriculum for um, their, their teacher programs. And the idea is to take um, either first language speakers or uh, folks that graduated from Master Apprentice and do two years addition to them. So we're hoping in the process of, of teaching different uh, teaching techniques and uh, child development and that sort of thing in Cherokee also helps to, to, high, to lift a higher proficiency. So uh, a lot of the Master Apprentice program, we're trying to a standard of what we call uh, advanced low and so it would be interesting to see what happens with two additional years so if we can hit something to the degree of uh, advanced mid or advanced high during that time it will kind of tell how high we can go what what our ceiling may be for second language learners uh, also we have the Institute of Excellence this program puts uh, is a new program that puts uh, older speakers uh, with younger speakers. So there is, um, we, ha we still have some uh, younger speakers in our community. When I say younger, generally that's in their 40s. But uh, them guys meeting with 80 and 90 year old speakers for, um, for three years, the, the concept of that is for uh, them to build proficiency up. So uh, we know that there's going to be uh, a big, a big uh, job ahead of everybody that's involved in language um, revitalization. And we know that them older speakers, they speak a higher registrar. So the, uh, the hope is that putting younger speakers with them older speakers and that being their job and them going through older documents together and them seeing words that some of the elders may have not thought about in a while and while they're still with us and documenting them uh, is going to be very powerful and hope that we can punt the ball uh, for a, a few younger speakers hitting a high proficiency of superior distinguished so that that's still here uh, 20, 30 years from now until we can catch up uh, with all of our other efforts. So that's going on as well. Uh, of course, uh, 
We've, we've been working with our uh, classroom platform. It's a, a program that we've worked with the, um, the immersion school. Uh, it's a, being extended to the language uh, uh, programs within the Sequoia High School right now. So uh, we received a, a grant not too long ago of a language uh, immersion expansion to kind of start working and building the groundwork to put a language track through the Sequoia High School. And so that virtual classroom and uh, will be a resource even after the pandemic for different language materials for the students. And so um, that, is, that is doing really good. Uh, the Inige and uh, uh, Cherokee language video game app, um, we're working on getting that copyrighted so we can get that released. Uh, we're, we're pretty close to that, and I think that uh, uh, Cherokee Nation, there's a, uh, a few awards and that sort of thing that's coming down because them, them projects is, has been really, really successful. But uh, we need to, of course, get that copyrighted so we can get that better out to our public. Um, during this year, this far since January 1st, um, as far as we know, there may be s someone that we've lost or missed. We we've lost 61 speakers. So, um, of course, last year we estimated losing 135, and then the year before 2019, uh, 110. So, uh, so this year thus far, uh, it's kind of um, February, March, that sort of stuff that started kind of waning. So that's that's a good sign. But it's something we keep an eye on all the time of losing the first our first language speakers. Uh, if uh, that be that concludes my report, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Howard. Anyone have questions? Yes, Councilor Nofire. <clears throat> hey, Howard. Um, I had had uh, several first language speakers come to me who uh, have tried to apply to teach the first uh, uh, the master language apprenticeship program and to be involved in our language department somehow teaching it. One is they, they were told that they were um, too, uh, too skilled, I guess, too, had too much knowledge about the language to be able to teach it. Um, so I didn't know if you could elaborate on that or why, they're, why our first language speakers aren't, aren't allowed to teach those classes. Councilman Nofar, I think that's a, a little bit of a, a misunderstanding. What happens a lot of times is we, there is when we open up them uh, slots for people to come in and learn Cherokee, we do have some first language speakers that apply for them slots. Um, and they, you know, we're, we're teaching, they'll come in as a three-year-old and we're working, you know, to get them higher in proficiency. And so that program with them slots that they're applying for is not teaching positions, what they are student positions. And so uh, when they apply for them, uh, they, uh, they, they want to be in that program and they already meet a higher proficiency than what we're building within that program, if that makes any sense. So it's, uh, it would so be. <clears throat> they're not applying as teachers, they're applying as students? Yes. Okay, because whenever I was talking to them about it, I was talking about being teachers and help teach the language. Um, the other thing I had is, what um, what I've kind of seen is because because a lot of my my aunts and uncles, in fact, all of my aunts and uncles on my dad's side and my great aunts and stuff, they're still fluent. Um, they're first language speakers. Uh, they're obviously of age now, looking to retire out. What kind of program could we look at? I know something I've discussed with them, something they've talked back. Maybe you guys have already discussed it. Um, the easiest age group to teach them is from babies, obviously. When we teach a language, when you talk, start them little, uh, you know, the first thing you, you, you show them is you show them, you know, a fish, that's a bass, that's unangam. You know, you, you tell them that the Cherokee language first before you right. tell them English. Um, is there a way we could possibly create jobs uh, for our first language speakers to be either be um, an after-school day daycare program at our at our community sites, like you know, I have Dry Creek and Tell Hope. These are the areas where a lot of our 
fluent first language speakers live at and their grandkids go to school at, at, in those areas, if we had an after school program that we could maybe pay those elders to go teach at, um, just a language for a couple hours, or maybe even a, a, um, a home babysitter. If you wanted a babysitter that is a first language speaker uh, the teacher kids, you can, you know, we have these these elders that we've also helped with, uh, you know, we've ran through a little small program to help them with babysitting, but it allows them to come inside your home and teach, you know, your kid while they're helping out around the house. Um, it's just, I'm thinking of other, other ways to take the first language speakers and, and involve them and what they want to do in trying to preserve the language and carry it to the next generation, because it skips some of us like me, but I've got kids who I can see that's the importance of trying to keep it alive uh, beyond just going to school at an immersion when they start there, maybe something more even at home or after school programs. We, well, we do have a after school program that's 14 generation. It is something that we do a summer intensive for 400 hours, and we also do two hours an evening. Uh, that's with the merger school in Sequoia. Um, it is something that one day when it's perfected that we understand that better. We, we do want to uh, talk about expanding it. Um, the, um, the new center that's being built for the Durban, Durban Field and Language Center, there will be a, a baby immersion where we start them at six weeks old. So the, um, the concept is, is um, we, we don't want to ever have a time in Cherokee Nation that we don't have first language speakers. And so we, we're going to have to really work hard because they have a different phonologically speaking or tonally. They have a, a different understanding to be able to um, project our language at a higher standard. So um, that's something that we think about daily, uh, Councilman, and that's that's a, a desire that we have. We know that that needs to happen, and it needs to happen soon. And so, um, the the idea is is we are hitting the high, high proficiencies with second language learners, uh, that's adults in, in the master apprentice program. Um, that is wonderful, um, but we don't want that to be the catch all save all. We want that. You know, the, the be first language speakers that comes from the womb. And so we're looking at programs, planning from six weeks old to, uh, uh, to adulthood. Um, hopefully after that center, we have, of course, that baby immersion and uh, the immersion track to, to uh, Sequoia. We'll have a, a situation where we start at six weeks old and then we, we move all the way to graduation of high school. Um, we're also looking at what, how can we even, because the babies start hearing um, sounds even in the mother's womb. And there is a, there's language rhythm and there's language beats and everything's different. Uh, so eventually we want to be able to offer language better to parents. And of course there's some that are in our master apprentice program where we're from, from um, as soon as that baby can hear sounds, they're here in Cherokee. So uh, it's something that we're working on. As far as going out to the, the communities uh, and uh, putting, um, you know, putting as many first language speakers as we can to work um, to find different language jobs, that's always something that is in consideration. Uh, we are. We have a lot of language jobs that we've opened up recently. And quite frankly, I don't know if it's because a, a lot of our first language speakers may not be seeing it online, but we're having to repost them over and over. So um, uh, we, we are looking for people, but we're looking for, of course, uh, dedicated folks that's uh, wanting to be uh, partners for a long time. So. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm glad to hear all that. The one thing that I've noticed, you know, growing up in a rural area is that you can pretty much identify your hot spots of where your first language speakers are. You know, 
You, know, you have a bunch there together in Kenwood, and you go down in Bell, and you go over in Dry Creek, and these little hot spots of where they're at. Um, it's it's almost as though you know, like you said, you want them first language speakers. You don't ever want that part to die. Um, of maybe going into those rural areas and trying to find families that want to. Be, like I said, this is just for discussion. I'll talk to you more offline. Not take up any more time, but. Um, even incentivizing a whole family to go through a full family language program right there in the rural community where they can talk to family members probably that they're related to and that way that baby that's growing up will have that as being their first language to speak to grandma and grandpa with so but i'm glad you guys are working on that glad you, you know, told a little bit more about it and uh, we'll talk some more offline about it appreciate it thank you councilman appreciate it, chair sure um councilor crittenden yeah. Howard, are we to the point yet where if they go through the master apprentice program that they're guaranteed a good job uh, helping with the language? We're getting pretty close to that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I know you guys are working hard, and I can just yeah. see, you know, if uh, someone was to go to the master apprentice program, you know, with, with the end goal of a career as well, you know, that's it. That's another. We talk about incentives all the time. Uh -huh. You know, there that that may could get more folks in the door, um, and that that would be a great thing if we could get to that point where, hey, by God, you come finish this, you're gonna have a career, yeah. and help us expand this language. Yeah. And I, but I appreciate what you're doing, and uh, if you're headed that direction. Sounds good. Thank you, sir. Thank you, no, Councilman. Yes. Anyone else? Yes, Councilor Lake. Hey, Howard. Have we uh, have we done a, a study on the uh, kids that first graduated our, our immersion school and to see if they retained their language and what their uh, proficiency is still in it? We haven't done the formal study. Um, I believe them um, them kids was last. Their proficiency was last, I think, in 2012. I know Mr. Kirk is here as well, and he was involved in that. Um, we we do have them coming in, and uh, we have talked to, to a lot of them. Um, some of that, the proficiency when the graduating class first came in was a little bit higher than what it, what it was recently, and so we're working to try to bump that up. Uh, our goal is for them kids to graduate in advance low. Um, we have recently uh, went and visited the um, the Ojibwe tribe that's in Haywood, Wisconsin, and um, you know a lot of their kids is hitting advanced low or advanced mid. And so the the idea that you have is is if a kid is is only this level. In, in, in English or in any language at this age, uh, it's hard to come in and say, okay, we're going to make sure you're going to hit this college level of, of language understanding. Uh, happy birthday, you know, sixth grader. You're going to have to, you know, really, really hump up. Uh, so there, there is some things that we have to, to view and look at in different standards. Um, we are in the process of redoing our, our curriculum at the emergent school, and it is something that we're we're looking at where we uh, start evaluating them, and there is standards because we we all talk about Oklahoma standards, that sort of thing. We want there to be a language standard in each level, in each grade of that that emergent school. So uh, that is something that Mr. Kirk is is working on uh, every day uh, to uh, to work. So uh, a week ago. We had a, a a retreat for our teachers, and we started saying, "Okay, what does it, what does a Cherokee need to know, uh, and at what standard and what age?" And so, if we if we want a Cherokee to know this at sixth grade or eighth grade, what do we need to do at three year old kindergarten, first grade, second, third, to make sure they hit that standard by the time they leave? So, uh, this is something that. Uh, we're working on. Uh, some of them have retained if they had family members, and some of them didn't hit 
maybe the standard they needed to hit to retain that as well. So uh, as studies go, uh, an actual standard of advanced mid, a lot of, um, a lot of folks say, okay, this is the, the place they no longer lose the language. Um, we've noticed that uh, that may not be the, the case. What we're trying to do is hit uh, internally. When somebody hits a advanced low, uh, they retain that language so much better. So we're trying to bump everything up to uh, the floor of being advanced low. So our thought process, our philosophy is um, if you pay attention to the floor of the lowest, lowest, you want to bump that floor up, the ceiling will take care of itself. And so we're always pushing up on that floor the best we can. Yes. Howard, just I want to commend you for an administration, our leadership, our chief, for even making an effort in, 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 in addressing the language issue that we have. And I want to thank you and your staff for doing an outstanding job. It seems like you're, you're covering almost every level of degree, first speaker, second language speakers. <clears throat> you know, the, one quick note is that the people that are not applying, most of those will be 55 and over those first language speakers, they probably don't have access or have the know-how to go through all of that, and I think you know that. Uh, in, in, you know, the Cherokee language, when I was a child, was essential. And now it's changed. In order to retain it now, you have to have a passion for it because of all the other <clears throat> influence that we've had over the years with the, with the media and the television and how our kids... And I feel for the parents where our, 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 our youth go through the immersion, and, and, I've, and I've listened to them talk. They do a really good job of learning. Our system really works there. It's that repetition when they go home that's lacking. And, and I learned the language by repetition, just listening, how you say water, <clears throat> how you say food, how you say I want. It's all repetition. That came before the syllabary. We didn't learn to, to learn. We didn't learn the syllabary when I was uh, in the first grade. We learned repetition on what our parents taught. That's the quickest way to learn the language. But I just appreciate, you know, how you're addressing the various levels and needs and the categories of the language. There, you guys are doing an outstanding job. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilman. We we have a, a great team, and uh, I tell you what, it's not uncommon um, to. Um, to go to sleep at 10 or 11 o'clock and by uh, the next morning somebody has emailed all the things that they worked on during the night. And that's how serious that these guys are looking at this every day that we have somebody just is trying to push a, a different level of our language to a higher standard. And so uh, our team is uh, to be commended. They're, they're awesome people. Thank you, Howard. Great report. Well, you join your lead, you see. Next up, Kevin Stretch, Community and Cultural Outreach. Good to see you, Kevin. See you in a good. Uh, you, you have a copy of my report in front of you. Uh, I would like to say that uh, this uh, this Saturday. At noon, we're going to have the uh, Jolly Gee Wherever We Are series going to continue, and it's going to have a uh, focus on Cherokee women. And uh, I wish all of the women in the Tribal Council and the Cabinet could, could uh, be available for that, but we have limited time. Uh, I would like to say that Deputy Speaker Vasquez will be there, as well as the Cabinet and the at-large Tribal Councilors uh, and the Delegate to Congress, T. Uh, and we're also going to do an interstitial about Chief Mankiller, Chikesa. So uh, tune in uh, on, on our YouTube channel this Saturday. Our online cultural ser series won't be held in August, so we can all be getting ready for the uh, virtual at large, I mean the virtual CCO conference. This will be our 17th annual. Uh, and it will be August the 21st from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. 
we're working with the uh, admin and departments and orgs and individuals to assess um, the, the possibility of can, uh, sending out cultural folks to um, to in district um, on, on reservation and at large. Um, currently, it doesn't look safe enough, um, but like I say, we're still looking at that. So we'll continue to do our online series. The uh, volunteer program, uh, we're going to revamp the report that I give you every month about the volunteer program because we do way more than just wheelchair ramps. Um, we, we don't, we aren't able to do, um, you know, heat and air, but there are a few people that they had their air conditioning breakdown during the 100 degree temperatures and so we provided uh, window units for them. Um, we do sheetrock repair, structural damage, uh, floor repair. We don't have equipment to do lawn mowing or tree removal. Um, we, nor garden equipment. Um, so we don't do electrical or plumbing or heat and air. We really just concentrate on structural. Uh, we did it assist in installing Wi-Fi satellites in the Belfont area recently um, um, in conjunction with the language program and the chief of staff. I would like to say that we also, we're also working with a language program. Uh, in, in particular, Stan Ross is a speaker for the language program, and he goes out um, and we try to assist speakers that are having issues that we can we can assist with. So that's what our volunteer program is working on. And uh, we just hired two new employees and labor positions. So with that, uh, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. Thank you. Yes, Councilor Novar. Yeah, I've, you know, we've, we've been now over a year with our community organizations shut down. And um, I've just been patiently waiting for those to reopen. They are the lifeblood to some of my communities. They are um, where a lot of our culture and our language exists, and our people haven't been able to get together. They haven't been able to go to our senior luncheons to see one another. I know they still see one another outside of those organizational events, but... Um, you know, I, I thought, you know, seeing the administration, groundbreaking ceremonies, um, you know, any time that there's an event put on, there's the Remember the Removal Ride event in which the pay, place was packed with people. Um, so when the administration puts something on, they do it open in public. But yet our community organizations that need to have that to keep things alive going they're not to remain. They're not allowed to open. It's not safe enough. I don't know when it's supposed to be safe enough. Um, I wish that it was safe enough now. But you know, with with the concern of of COVID being a reason not to open up, yet we've had everyone op, op, offer up to get vaccinated in the area. So as much as it is a concern not to get anybody sick and to keep the spread from happening. Um, the citizens have been offered and everyone knows how to get the vaccines and since they've been offered it at some point we're going to have to take in consideration what's important here can can we look at saving our language and our culture in covid or are we going to be so resistant to keeping the doors from opening that it's going to eventually you know, cost us losing part of our culture and our heritage from not being able to get together in these, in these, uh, um, at our event buildings. They're 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 very uh, concerned. I think we've all used used them. I think everybody here in this, in this council has has probably had concerns in their back of the mind about when that's going to open. Um, so it is a concern when I see the administration put things on, but yet we have the doors closed to our community buildings. Um, Businesses are open, you know, our businesses are open, but yet our people getting together to talk about issues about their community, you know, it remains closed. So, um, you know, I think it's just more of a, I hope you can take that back as a concern 
for me and my district and my citizens and, and try to figure out some, some sort of remedy of when we're going to be able to see those doors open. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. I, I would like to say that a couple of weeks ago, uh, I did send an email out to the organizations, uh, to the community buildings, and told them that it was okay to, to open up the doors um, as long as they followed CDC guidelines and as well as, um, you know, if they knew everyone was vaccinated, we still wanted everyone to wear a mask. We, uh, the Cherokee Nation provides all the masks and all the sanitization um, uh, spray that they would like. Uh, we, so we, we have allowed them to reopen again. So they, so they are reopening again. That's awesome. I did not get an email. I have not. I mean, I'm sitting here going, <laughs> when are we going to open it? Okay. And I'm glad that that's now we're, we're open. I've not heard that spread yet out through my community. So that's good. Have you heard about it yet? No. So that's good. So are, are we able to now look at moving forward with hosting a community event in our, in our district? I think, I think Councilor Legg was mentioning that to me just, just now. Um, already planning them. I think Joe Deere's already planning. Joe Deere's already on top of it. He's <laughs> he's been staying quiet over here, not sharing with anything with anybody. So, but um, yeah, because that's that's something that I think we're we're all looking forward to. I think I'm thinking I'm really relieved here now hearing that. Okay. So, would you like to say, Madam Chair, if I may? No, yeah, yes. you're up there. Go ahead. Um, Thank you. So just to reaffirm, we did send, or Kevin and uh, the CCO group did communicate um, that we were opening, allowing them to open back up. We do want them to continue to be safe, wear a mask uh, if, if they know all participants in a small group are vaccinated. Uh, they wouldn't necessarily have to wear a mask. Uh, but I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to issue this today based on information that we had with our health care team this morning. Um, our numbers are increasing and our numbers are alarming to me uh, for the number of cases that we're now seeing. And so I just ask that each of you uh, and uh, community centers as well uh, keep in mind and uh, I personally uh, have been lax in my mask wearing in public places and spaces um, and uh, I am, I have in the last two days gone back to wearing my mask full time uh, because it is moving through our communities at a high rate. And it is, as we discussed a little bit yesterday in health committee meeting, uh, moving from Missouri, Northwest Arkansas, uh, and our vaccination rates in some of our counties are at 21%. And so, what we're seeing is a fair majority of those that are testing positive are unvaccinated. And um, so just leave that there food for thought and let you know that, that the variant and COVID is still present and moving through our communities at an alarming rate. And we'll be sharing some more information in the coming days of what those numbers are beginning to look like. So I'm just, I'm concerned about what that's gonna do um, to our hospital and healthcare systems once again. So, I was just going to finish one comment since Chief of Staff's up here, and I think I've mentioned it even health. I think that um, the you know because I I I got vaccinated, and I think that that there's still just a lot of that out there is reason why the numbers aren't up with vaccination, and maybe since um, Mr. Stretch is here too, something to. And maybe you've looked at is how we can even push more information out there. These community events uh, that we may be looking at hosting to try to get just people more comfortable with the idea of getting vaccinated. It's a very uncomfortable thing in our rural areas. They don't they don't seem to want to talk about it as much, um, discuss it. They're just, they've already made their mind up. And how can we maybe reopen their mind back up and and, get, and getting that across to them? Uh, yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, it, our public health team, our health team, communications teams are all working with uh, community partners uh, from various areas uh, to try and increase education and understanding and find ways to, uh, to encourage citizens to become vaccinated. So uh, we are working on that very thing.
Thank you, Chief of Staff. And anyone else have questions for Kevin? We're getting close to 10 o'clock. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Really good report, Kevin. Appreciate you. you. We have one more report from Ms. Betty Frog from our Cherokee National Treasurer's Advisory Committee. Hi, Betty. See you on a God. See you. Whew, I'll take this mask off. Okay. Um, I'm going to make this short and sweet. I heard I had less than five minutes or less. <laughs> so, um, the, a total of 11 uh, nominations were made for the new national treasures. Um, the, the chief, I think, has contacted the new treasures and hasn't released the names yet, and I, too, will not release the names until he does. And the Cherokee National Treasures uh, featured at the Saline Courthouse are, um, as you see, listed Dorothy Sullivan, July, August, Bessie Russell, Basketry, September, October, and uh, November, December, we had um, the Van Bus Kirks, and they opted out because there was too much going on at the time. There are four National Treasures currently holding classes uh, in the mentorship program with a total of 20 students. Uh, these classes are in pottery, basket weaving, loom weaving, and bow making. Uh, this year's student art show, which was normally held in July, will be held in conjunction with the holidays this year, which will be um, with the Cherokee Artisan Marketplace to be held on the lawn of the Cherokee Nation History Museum. And we also lost two treasures, um, Catherine Kelly in basketry and Jesse Hummingbird in painting. And I made that short and sweet. So if you have any questions. <laughs> Thanks, Betty. Yes, Councilor Crittenden. Hi, good lady. See you. Um, had somebody ask me the how do you nominate a national treasure? Can you tell me? Uh, yeah, I can. Um, the no nomination forms are usually put out. Um, I think we put them out in starting in May, June. We put those nomination forms in there and all the... Uh, Everything that the person needs to uh, turn in, fill out, is on that sheet. We also send out a sheet with a, pl uh, with a list of the nom places you can nominate a, uh, a, an artist. And they also, <coughs> excuse me, they also have to turn in a basket, a bow, or whatever it is they're nominated for. Okay. Um, now, when you, <coughs> like when you send the forms out, is there a... Where do you send those to? To um, CNB Donetta Johnson. But that might be who they need to contact. Yes. Donetta. If they have any questions, they can um, contact Donetta, Donetta or they can t contact anybody on the advisory board. Donetta Johnson, CNB. Will they be able to contact her through that 4535000 and ask for her? Or does CNB have a different generic number? I'm not sure, but we can. I can let you know. Um, you could also contact me. I can always oh. get uh, the form is sent out in um, the National Treasurer's Update newsletters, and also don't you send it to the Phoenix? Mm-hmm. Okay. We advertise. Yes. So, okay. And that, you said that's around. Do you say May? Um, we is it around May June. June is the deadline. So in the Phoenix, probably. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a few months before June. Right. Donetta. Donetta Johnson. Well, well golly. Really she does a great job being the liaison with our... <laughs> well, that uh, was handy. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> our National Treasures Board. So right. um, she is right here and can answer any questions. Right. Ma'am, if you don't mind, just shoot me an email with your contact info. And, okay. And I've just had a couple people ask me how, and I just... Never knew, really. We were going to try to get out into the communities, but somehow we just didn't get out there to the community meetings. Mm -hmm. um, we were trying to get further out in the communities uh, to get more nominations from different parts of Cherokee, um, the 14-county area. Oh, yeah. But it didn't happen. Y'all got some good ones, so thank y'all. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Anyone else? Thank you, Betty, for that good report. Good to see well you. Have a good day. All right. Old business, none pending. New business, none pending. Announcements, anyone have any? 
Um, the next meeting is tentatively scheduled for Thursday, September 30th at 11 a.m. Can I have a motion for adjourn? Motion to make. Okay. We are adjourned. Thank you.